We are very pleased today to be hosting this panel discussion, uh, sponsored also with the Center for National Security Law. Um, ICAP, for those of you who don't know, we are a litigating institute within Georgetown. We bring constitutional impact litigation across a wide range of issue areas, and we involve students in our work. So we do criminal justice reform, we do First Amendment work, we do separation of powers, we do immigration work, we do excessive police excessive force work, and we have a niche expertise in suing private militias, which you'll hear a little bit more about. Um, I think we're the only organization that can say that actually right now, although SPLC pioneered this work back in the early 1980s. So many of us watched um, uh, the hearings of the House Select Committee last summer through the fall, um, and they told the story of this multi-pronged effort to undermine the will of the voters in the 2020 election and to disrupt the peaceful transition of presidential power. The multi-prongs, as, as we were told by the committee over the course of the hearings, included the spread of disinformation and misinformation about election fraud. It included pressure on the Department of Justice to announce that they were searching for election fraud and to uh, uh, promulgate false, false narratives about election fraud. It included pressure on then Vice President Pence to not certify the results of the election on January 6th and potentially even to count the fraudulent elector ballots that had been sent, uh, submitted by uh, Republican electors in seven states. It included pressure on the state legislators and election officials to change the results of their state races. And it included, when all of that failed, it included summoning the mob. Uh, especially with the tweet on Trump, President Trump's tweet on December 19th, be there, will be wild. Um, and finally, it included failing to act once the mob violently assaulted the Capitol. That's the story that a lot of us heard through the committee hearings. And for many people, that might be the only story they heard. But this multi-pronged effort was reported in 850 pages of the final report and many, many volumes of underlying documents and uh, digital evidence that have been released by the committee or was released, were released by the committee before the end of the congressional term. And these are the things that we hope to bring a little bit of light to today because it's way too voluminous for most of us to actually get through. So today we're gonna take a deep dive into some of these materials revealing the extremism that allowed the plan to come dangerously close to fruition. We'll talk directly with six of the investigators, investigative counsel, who were responsible for investigating the individuals who actually planned and took part in the January 6th attack, as well as the role of social media in facilitating that attack. Together, today's panelists, um, deposed or interviewed over 70 witnesses for the select committee. They assisted in the production of nearly all of the committee's televised hearings. They drafted significant portions of the final report and they interviewed dozens of members of the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers and other paramilitary groups as well as social media whistleblowers. So to introduce them uh, on screen today, we have Marcus Childress and in the room, Sean Quinn and James Sasso who are all part of the red team. Now you may have heard about the, the color-coded teams. The red team was primarily focused on how the participants in the insurrection prepared for and carried out the attack on that day, January 6th of 2021. They took the lead in deposing individuals who had been charged by the Department of Justice for their role in the attack, as well as mapping out a minute by minute a TikTok of the day as the assault unfolded. Jacob Glick, Sandeep uh, Prasanna, and Megan Conroy uh, are, uh, were part of the purple team. So the purple team was responsible for examining broader questions related to extremism, the rise of far-right extremism, as well as the social media, uh, re the role of social media in the attack. They worked closely with the red team to depose members of, of private paramilitary groups, again, like the Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, Three Percenters. Now, there were other color-coded teams you may recall. <clears throat> there were, was the gold team, which was focused on the actions of President Trump and his inner circle uh, as they sought to overturn the election results. There was the blue team, uh, focused on the response of law enforcement. The green team, focusing on the response of 
uh, fundraising rather for Stop the Steal, and the Orange Team focused on potential foreign interference. But today, we're going to focus on the work of the red and purple teams. And we'll dive deeper into the Select Committee's evidence about the threat of domestic violent extremism and how it continues to present an ongoing threat today. Um, so let's get started. Now, I want to begin with um, what the select committee, what the red and purple teams really found out about the role of paramilitary organizations in uh, the lead up to and on January 6th. But I got to preface that because I did give a little teaser there that one of ICAP's sort of niche areas of expertise is suing private militias. And one thing we know from that work, we've sued successfully uh, the militias that participated in the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017. Uh, as well as militias that, that uh, were responsible for creating a heightened tension and violence in New Mexico during the summer of, June of 2020 after, uh, during racial justice demonstrations after George Floyd was murdered. And those cases were based on state anti-militia law, which exists in all states. So we know that many of these paramilitary organizations that were involved in the lead up to and on the day of January 6th they believe that they have a constitutional right, or I'm going to ask you, at least what I've read uh, and those I've talked to seem to believe they have a constitutional right to um, be their own private army, to rise up as a bulwark against a tyrannical uh, federal government or even tyrannical state governments for that matter. Now, contrary to that mythology, we know from our litigation and from our research that there is no federal or state authority for private armies or private militias. Uh, the Constitution bakes into it well regulated, well regulated since before even the founding has meant regulated by the government. Early 1600s and 1700s militia acts required that the militia, all able bodied men capable of being called forth by the governor to defend the colonies, they always reported to the governor. Uh, they, they were not, they had no independent authority to. Um, arrange and organize themselves to be opposing the government. And in fact, that is what caused rebellions like Shays rebellions and things like that, that led to the adoption of the well-regulated language in the Second Amendment. We also know that the Supreme Court has held since 1886 that the Second Amendment does not protect private armies. Uh, the Supreme Court held that states must be able to prohibit them in order to protect public safety, peace, and good order. <clears throat> and the Supreme Court reiterated that in 2008 in District of Columbia versus Heller, which held for the first time that there's an individual right to bear arms for self-defense uh, encompassed within the Second Amendment, but pointedly contrasted that with private paramilitary organizations. And Justice Scalia, writing for the majority there, explained uh, and reiterated the holding of Presser that nothing in the Second Amendment prohibits states from, pre from, from prohibiting private paramilitary organizations. And finally, we know that all 50 states prohibit them. Uh, 48 build it right into their state constitutions. 29 have anti-militia laws. 25 have anti-paramilitary activity laws. Every state has something. So why then this um, uh, broadly held mythology about the Second Amendment? And why then I think uh, the question for some of the panelists is, do these private paramilitary groups think that they have the authority to take it upon themselves to determine whether the election uh, was tainted by fraud and, and, um, and the transition of power should not result? So I want to turn first uh, to you, Marcus, um, uh, because I understand your work on the Red Team focused on how groups like the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys deployed on January 6th. Now, we know right now members of the Oath Keepers not only were charged with seditious conspiracy and other crimes, but num a number of them, including their leader, Stuart Rhodes, have now been convicted of seditious conspiracy and multiple other crimes. Um, these are one of the, one of the rare successful seditious conspiracy cases the government has brought against domestic organizations. Um, and we know right now the Proud Boys trial is still ongoing, and that trial also includes charges of seditious conspiracy. So what do you think, Marcus, is sort of the most important thing for the American public to understand about the evidence that the committee um, gathered um, regarding these paramilitary groups and their participation on January 6th? 
Yes, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, it's good to see all my former colleagues uh, in Washington, D.C. I'm apologize that I can't be there. Funny enough, I'm in middle Florida, which a lot of the witnesses that we interviewed uh, were from, especially the Oath Keepers. But to get to your question, and I'm going to keep a lot of my answers today pretty tight. I apologize in advance. Um, as we just discussed, a lot of these cases are still ongoing. There's still ongoing DOJ investigations and criminal trials. Um, and look, I'm not privy to the evidence that the Department of Justice has collected. All I can share really is what the committee uncovered, which was in our report, and then some of our impressions, some of my personal impressions, and I'm sure the rest of the panelists will provide theirs. One of the things that stood out to me and kind of our approach to looking at the Oath Keepers and Proud Boys was that January 6th was not the first time that they had provided what I consider security support for these grassroots type uh, meetings or events or or, um, or rallies. Um, Sandeep and I in particular, I felt like we were the purple red team approaching it from different angles where I was kind of just trying to establish what events the Oath Keepers and Proud Boys were attending who had invited them, why were they there, what did they think their purpose in being that event was. And then Sandeep, as I'm sure he'll probably talk about later, really approached like the, what do you believe is your purpose as a, as a group? And, and what were you trying to, what message were you trying to convey in being there? And so that was kind of the, the two angles we approached it with. But starting with the election all the way through January 6th, if you look at any Stop the Steal or most Stop the Steal events, um, in most events that were protesting, uh, the election, you had a combination of Oath Keeper and Proud Boy presence there, and they were there to provide security. And I say security in quotes. Um, they were invited by the organizers of the events most of the times. And I, I, actually, I take that back. It wasn't even like they were expressly invited via text, like, hey, we want the Proud Boys to be there. A lot of times we found in our interviews with that uh, these groups were fighting out the events online or via Twitter or Telegram, and they were going to where the action was to provide their security support. Um, we heard a lot of references to Antifa and other left-wing type groups that they were providing the protection for. Um, so if you go all the way from that first rally uh, in November after the election to the December rally in D.C., the various rallies in Georgia or in Arizona, all throughout the country, um, you, you saw Oath Keepers and Proud Boys there. Another point that I think is important to highlight was that um, they weren't necessarily there working in concert, right? You didn't have the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers there communicating with one another, like you work that perimeter and I work this perimeter. Um, they were there with their own groups and their own focus of what they wanted to achieve and their own, actually their own style. Um, and that was very apparent in the interviews that we had with Oath Keepers and Proud Boys was just their different styles to approaching these, these um, events. Um, So you have kind of them becoming even more familiar with each other from the November election all the way through January 6th. Um, And then the the big moment that I know captured a lot of the the country's attention, that January 5th um, conversation meeting, however you want to phrase it, between Enrique Terrio and Stuart Rhodes in the garage in Washington, D.C., you know, just 24 hours before the attack on January 6th. So if I wanted to convey one point here, though, is that it wasn't January 6th wasn't the first time these groups have provided security for a grassroots um, event or a rally. This had been going on before the election, as I know Sandeep and Jacob know better than I do. But really, you know, from the election all the way through January 6th, if there was a stop the steal rally or a rally of that nature that was gaining a lot of um, public attention, you probably had some form of Oath Keeper and Proud Boy support there to provide security, in quotes. Queuing off of that, Marcus, thank you. Uh, let's just go to Sandeep and to Jacob to, to talk a little bit, to you know, take us backwards in time just a little bit about how these groups got involved. Because listening to you, Marcus, it sounds a little bit like they use providing security against this quote unquote Antifa threat as a way to maybe ingratiate themselves with the folks who they were pro- providing protection from. Am I right about that, Sandeep? Well, <clears throat> first of all, Thank you for for having us on this panel um, and organizing this event. It's it's great to be with um, former colleagues. You know, thinking about the lead up to January 6th and how these groups networked and coalesced and mobilized, you know, there was a lot of muscle memory that was built over the course of 2020. Um, 
You had events at state capitals. You had counter protests to the racial justice protests over the summer. You had COVID lockdown protests. Um, and then you had Stop the Steal protests. All of these were opportunities for Proud Boys, Oath Keepers, other groups, um, self-defined militias to kind of, you know, essentially operate, like, like Marcus said, as security. Um, and they weren't necessarily hired. They were there um, to defend against a sort of ambiguous and vaguely defined threat of Antifa or Black Lives Matter. And when you ask them who those people are, they can't really identify them. Um, and those, you know, in many cases, the same people were involved in those prior events that were involved in January 6th. And um, it was a, you know, slow buildup throughout the course. We also saw them providing security at political rallies as well, too, like four candidates or four people who were elected. Um, can you speak to that or, or just to this topic, Jacob? Sure, yeah. I Thank you for having all of us. It's great to be here. Um, I think that one story that came across quite consistently in our depositions was that a lot of these actors um, were motivated to initially become intermeshed in extremism um, around the time of the COVID lockdowns. Take the uh, chief lawyer for the Oath Keepers, Kelly Sorrell, um, told us that she first got involved in the uh, anti-lockdown protests in uh, Texas, and she met the Oath Keepers in that context, um, and also saw the Oath Keepers get involved with a lot of far-right politicians who were involved in the anti-lockdown protests at the time. So you have this drumbeat of um, sort of acrimony against Democratic politicians who were uh, shutting down cities, quote unquote. And then in the summer, those same Democratic politicians are letting Antifa and BLM, a lot of our witnesses conflated those two, um, letting them run loose in places like Portland and elsewhere. Uh, and then you had those same Democratic politicians, um, often defined in terms that were quite conspiratorial, stealing the election from Donald Trump in November. So we saw this uh, clear through line that gave individuals and the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, other militia groups, um, an entree to become involved in far-right extremism because they, they were told that all the propaganda the Oath Keepers and others were putting out there about constitutional duty to sort of take up arms against tyranny, that was the crisis point. 2020 provided a rolling crisis for them to jump in. Um, and to your point, Mary, um, you saw political organizers welcoming uh, these actors into their camp uh, and not shunning them as violent uh, paramilitaries. Uh, one example that always sticks out to me is the um, Jericho March on December 12, 2020 in Washington, where a lot of these groups converged and you had internal chats that the committees published uh, that include sort of pro-Trump political organizers and uh, members of the Oath Keepers, uh, including Sue Rhodes, talking about the need for security. So this sense of paranoia and conspiracy pervaded the entire um, seen uh, and led to the situation that eventually became January 6th. Yeah. Um, so, um, Mary, when you when you started the panel, you mentioned the kind of mythology around the constitutional rights mm -hmm. to um, you know, the Second Amendment, self-defense, and private militias. Mm -hmm. um, and what Jacob just talked about um, reminded me that, you know, it, a lot of this kind of paranoid conspiratorial ideology is on display in the open letters that Stuart Rhodes was publishing on the Oath Keepers website in the lead up to January 6th. I mean, if you want to look at what they, the messages that were being propagated within that group and um, you know, beyond as well, all you have to do is look at those letters, which were available online until recently. Um, and the committee has also published them. I would note too, you know, that didn't start in 2020. Back during the first impeachment proceedings, um, I wrote about Stuart Rhodes at the time uh, responding to a President Trump tweet by saying, if there's an effort essentially to remove the president from office, just call us up, meaning the Oath Keepers. And he even said, we are in a hot civil war and our preferred weapon is the AR-15. So long, you know, long before we even got to pandemic or George Floyd's murder or stop the steal, this was the type of, um, uh, you know, rhetoric that he was promulgating, that they had some authority to be this force that could be called up. And we can come back later as we talk about he even, you know, I think through his trial was trying to make a defense that, well, President Trump might have called us up under the Insurrection Act to be like a legitimate force, which, of course, 
um, they're not a legitimate force. But uh, let me go to Sean to talk a little bit more specifically, because I think you um, did a lot of the work with uh, interviews of members of the Proud Boys. What can you tell us about the Proud Boys in, in particular uh, with respect to their planning and, and activity on January 6th? Because they're different than the Oath Keepers, right? The Oath Keepers, they deploy in military kits with AR-15s and multiple magazines and flak jackets and helmets and combat boots. And, you know, they pretend, you know, in patches and they pretend to be like a real military force. That's not what the Proud Boys do. Yeah, no. And and first I'll echo everybody's thanks. For that. Um, no, you're right. The Proud Boys were different and, and distinct from the Oath Keepers. So I think they thought of themselves to the extent that they were engaging in violence at the rallies as kind of street brawlers. To them, it was honestly sort of, kind of a fun activity that they engaged in. They called themselves the Rally Boys, um, and and so so that aspect certainly distinguishes them. But as you continue through the events of November and December and into January sixth, um, they kind of change their approach a little bit based on what's happening at at those rallies in November and December. Um, and then in particular, in December when the event with Jeremy Patino happens, where he's stabbed, that becomes sort of a turning point for the group. Where they ha now have this this real justification to kind of arm up, to defend themselves in a way that they weren't necessarily before, um, and and sort of change their approach, and then again justified the creation of the Ministry of Self Defense, which becomes kind of their separate central core organization that really drives all the planning that goes into the United States. Um, and so really, it's sort of an escalation that happens over those uh, those events that, that changes their approach. And then puts them in a position where they're actually a little bit more like the contacts. They really have kind of hit it up, put on all this gear, arrive armed and ready to do something. And in the course of that sort of evolution of their approach, it seems like at some point they took a little bit of a turn with respect to their relationship to the police. Did that come out in your investigation? Yeah, I think that's I think that's true, and and again, particularly in the November and December events, because there's this, uh, you know, in addition to interviewing the Proud Boys, there's the officers that were engaged on those days, and both groups just described kind of this game of cat and mouse, where um, the Proud Boys kind of on their face respected the police officers uh, and what MPD were trying to do on those days, but but really were trying to circumvent them, and as you move closer to December and then into January sixth the uh, confrontations become a little bit more frenetic, even with this. Um, and so I think it does change their view. And then also just kind of the, their political uh, assessment of DC as a city um, becomes sort of a, a, a different dynamic that they have to deal with. And, and they think that the DC city police uh, you know, are not on their side. And in fact, we saw communications where they thought maybe the Capitol Police were, but that, uh, that they drew a distinction. So, and it's interesting too, because new reporting, of course, has come out about a, a DC police officer who was actually communicating with um, the Proud Boys and arguably, you know, giving them a heads up about different things, particularly with respect to um, criminal uh, arrests. Maybe we'll come back to that. Um, James, uh, you also, I think, um, had a role in interviewing another members of another militia group, the Three Percenters. And I guess I'm also interested not only in what you learned through that, but also this relationship with the police and whether that changed. And we talked a little bit about all these events, Oath Keepers, Three Percenters, where they were providing security and protection throughout the year, sometimes to elected officials or candidates. And did you, uh, did you see there a relationship with the police and did that change as time went on? Oh, first of all, again, Thank you for having us. The obligatory the thank obligatory you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Once one person does it, yes, we all have, we yes, all have to right. It is actually awesome to be back with everybody. And I have to thank uh, Marcus and Sean for giving me the short stick when I jo joined the red team to actually look into the three percenters. Mm -hmm. Unlike the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers, who are much more of an organized group. So I'll start with a little bit of the weirdness of what three percenters are. Uh, it is both an ideology in a sense. It's also sort of like a fashion statement. And then there are groups that actually identify as three percenters. So very quickly, the idea of three percenter, it's, it's a false myth that 3% of the American population beat back the British in the, starting in 1776. So trying to identify with the revolution. 
And to your point about militia groups, a lot of these, the people that we found who identified as three percenters had been part of militias well before uh, the election, before COVID. Uh, this has been a thing going on in America for a long time. We had people mention the Bundys in uh, Oregon. Or Bundy was in a Bunkerville, Nevada. Bunkerville, Nevada. There you go. Uh, 2014. Yeah. <laughs> so it's been an ongoing problem in, in the country. And, and so I'll, I'll talk about the police part first because mm -hmm. I found that very interesting. Um, just in general, we watched a lot of film of the attack and the irony of seeing Blue Lives Matter flags held by people who are beating police were also wearing three percenter patches. And when we interviewed people, um, you know, whether they directly affiliated with the three percenters or were part of a group or just said they, they liked the idea of it, they always claimed that they were on the side of the police and that they were there to defend American values, to help the people who are defending the Constitution. Uh, they, claim to be pro-police, but when you drill down on it, you know, often it was, uh, you know, one of the purple team members, Cindy for Jacob and I, and asking them, so what does it mean if the police, you know, want to stop you from having a gun at an event or something? Uh, what if they disagree, if they're there protecting, you know, the Capitol on that day, what does it mean? And unfortunately, the answer was, and you see this a lot in uh, the Department of Justice filings too, and what defendants say as in the lead up, it comes down to this idea that three percenters thought they were saving the country. And if you think you're saving the country, it doesn't matter who's standing in your way and what their titles are, what they're wearing. Either they join your side and they're right, or they're on the other side and they're your enemy, and who cares that they're police anymore? And that rhetoric, which we tracked with social media posts, with again, DOJ filings and uh, interviews, you can see a real shift in December mm -hmm. from, you know, a lot of like Blue Lives Matter, Protect the Police. And as you get closer to January 6th, people saying the police are no longer on our side. It's very explicit in the Oath Keepers, the Donald dot win, a lot of this stuff. Megan can definitely mm -hmm. talk about that more than I can. Um, you just notice how as you get closer to the event, it turns into they're not on our side. They're going to try to stop us from saving the country. They cannot be the protectors of the Constitution. So did you get the sense when you were interviewing them, because you're, you know, what you said was pretty profound, right? If somebody is standing in, in the way of saving the country, they're going to take action. Did they really believe that they needed to save the country or, or was it part of the, um, the image? That is a great question, but I think, uh, I really think most people who were susceptible to the view that the election was stolen and who fell prey to all the, the lies of President Trump really felt that the country for many years had been being taken away from them. Obviously, that's a lot of coded language mm -hmm. or racist uh, views or economic views or whatever it may be. But, uh, you know, you, t you see a lot of the same sort of idea that socialist Democrats are taking over the country. What Stuart Rhodes was saying in his letters that uh, China and the UN are coming in to take over. So there was this fear. There was a legit, not legitimate, sorry. There was a uh, actually held belief that if they didn't stop Joe Biden from becoming president, something terrible would happen, you know, on January 6th or on January 20th. It's a lot of, you know, you hear that in QAnon, uh, that something, they were waiting for something to happen, to save the country. And I do think a lot of them believed it. And I think some of them on the other side came out and we talked to a lot of defendants, especially Marcus and I, and uh, some of them felt like they got duped. But a lot of people still were like, well, the country, you know, the country's in danger and someone needs to do something about it. So that leads directly, Megan, into my question for you, which is uh, Meg, these conspiracy theories, this false narrative about a stolen election, whether people came as part of the three percenters or Oath Keepers or Proud Boys or just, you know, they came because they had a sincere belief that they needed to go because the president, former president had called them there. What did you see? Because you, you are a researcher into social media. You currently work for digital forensic research labs, uh, continuing to do uh, forensic research. What how did this develop and what was the role of social media in providing this false narrative that led to um, January 6th? Um, well, thank you, of course, for having me. Uh, happy to have the, the gang back together. Um, 
Yeah, I think what was really fascinating about what we saw on social media when we were conducting the investigation is that we saw these seemingly diverse groups of people who may have even held diametrically opposed views um, or slightly, you know, different grievances, all kind of mobilizing under the banner of Trump. And so we have groups like the Oath Keepers and Proud Boys, um, you know, kind of more decentralized movements like, you know, the, the three percenters who absolutely composed um, a, a core element of what happened on January 6th and, and drove a lot of the violence and, and even drove a lot of the propaganda that led up to the day. But, you know, in actuality, only a minority of the individuals arrested on January 6th actually boasted membership in these organizations. So a lot of the social media research that we conducted on um, this postmortem we did was focused on those those unaffiliated individuals who comprise the majority of people who not only showed up on January 6th, but also who were violent on January 6th. And I, I think to kind of start things off, I, I think it's important to situate those unaffiliated people within the broader coalition of people who showed up on January 6th. So, um, you know, like, like James has spoke about, we have the Christian nationalists. So that will be the QAnon folks, the Groyper slash America first folks, really anyone who advocates for this like divinely ordained theocratic or otherwise authoritarian government governance structure. Um, and then we have the fascists, um, that'll be the the neo-Nazis. Like we had some folks from NSC 131 show up and the Proud Boys. I know they like to call them Western, themselves Western chauvinists. That is propaganda. They are fascists. Don't let them tell you otherwise. Um, and then we have the Patriot Movement, which is comprised of groups like the Oath Keepers um, and, and, you know, like, like the Three Percenters, as well as just kind of, you know, other militias or groups, um, you know, the paramilitaries um, who really buy into the anti-government narratives and, you know, think that, or like to convey the notion that they're these hardcore constitutionalists who are fighting against tyranny, upholding the constitution, et cetera. And then that's where these unaffiliated folks come into play. And so for the purposes of the committee's investigation, we kind of argued that this broader MAGA category was composed primarily of these unaffiliated individuals who were mobilized largely by their loyalty to former President Trump. And as opposed to like organizational doctrine or like you know, the, the collaboration that happens within boundary groups. And I think it's a fair characterization of these unaffiliated folks who showed up on January 6th to describe them as like these illiberal conservatives whose hero, President Trump, is an illiberal authoritarian um, in his style of governance and the narratives he was pushing. And the reason this is such a big deal is because that that category of people was the biggest part of the coalition by not an insignificant portion. And so it's it's obviously not an issue that a lot of Trump supporters showed up on January 6th to support their president. That's fine. Support your First Amendment night, right? Go nuts. But the problem is that so many people, seemingly everyday Americans, were willing to usurp democracy, to harm perceived enemies, um, to threaten police or kill police um, and, and members of Congress. And so the social media investigation really centered on how did people get to that point? And I know obviously my my former colleagues have touched on the various conspiracy theories and you know the the various narratives like COVID nineteen and um, you know COVID vaccine COVID nineteen not only you know the lockdowns but masks and vaccines and the various conspiracy theories surrounding those um, and obviously the steady drumbeat of anti democratic sentiment um, that started long before the election and. Ultimately, radicalization is an inherently individualized process. This is a well-established fact in conspiracy, in, sorry, not in conspiracy theories, in extremism studies. Um, and so what we found during our investigation wasn't really surprising. Um, we found that there was a relatively diverse set of grievances that really kind of motivated these unaffiliated folks to, to show up, you know, to, to bring along their, you know, their wife or their brother or whatever. And What's noteworthy about that, though, is no matter the diversity of this unaffiliated mob's grievances, they all showed up to keep Trump in power. And some of them were willing to kill or die to ensure that Trump would continue being their president. And a jaw dropping number of people who were not part of extremist groups were willing to do those things. And so I think the key takeaway here is that most extremists are not really affiliated with extremist groups. And a lot of them are kind of 
co-radicalizing and co-mobilizing and collaborating in online spaces and social media platforms have allowed them to do that. Thanks, Megan. And we're going to come back to that in a little bit. But you, where you ended there with how many people were willing to actually commit acts of violence and at least say they were willing to die for former President Trump leads me really to the next kind of set of questions, which is about this intersection between Trump and uh, the groups, the extremist groups that came there, who I think at least had some role in radicalizing others, the unaffiliates, like you said. And, you know, that's something I know the select committee was very interested in looking at. It's something that Jacob and I published an article, I don't know, on the anniversary, I guess, the second anniversary of January 6th, looking into this a little bit of ourselves in just security. But um, I want to start actually with you, Marcus, again, and then we'll we'll talk to the others about um, what you learned with, I know, I know you focused a lot on that day, but before. But earlier, before you focused on that day, you focused a little bit on, on how we got to that day. What did you find about that intersection between Trump and these groups um, leading up to and on January 6th? That, and that's correct. So I did, I focus on the day, but you can't really tell the story of the day unless you go back at least some time to try to understand the TikTok and the key, kind of the key key moments leading up to January 6th. Um, I know Sean, uh, interviewed Bianca Gracia. So I'm going to defer to him on that piece. But what we saw was that there was like one degree of separation from people who were either in President Trump's ear or appeared to be in his ear. And then these extremist groups. And an example is Roger Stone, for example. Um, look, we were able to obtain the Friends of Stone group chat where events were being shared with a group of if we want to be friendly grassroots organizers, as well as extremist group members and leaders, including Stuart Rhodes and Enrique Terrio, where Roger Stone would send an event of, I'm speaking here at this Florida event, or Stuart Rhodes would say that the Oath Keepers are going to be at this event, or other people would say um, grassroots events that they were attending leading up to January 6th. Uh, another example of someone that we deposed was Ali Alexander, right? Someone who we uncovered Twitter DMs and other chats of him talking to congressional members. And yet you have Ali Alexander inviting Oath Keepers to be his protective group on January 6th, paying for their hotel rooms and coordinating for them to be there. So it's really just one degree of separation between people who appear to have the ear of President Trump or congressional members who have the ear of President Trump, former President Trump, and then these extremist groups who were there providing security or there to just be where the action was on January 6th. Yeah, so Sean, continue with that uh, with respect to what you learned. Yeah, so um, you know, like Marcus said, there were there's there's really one degree of separation between folks that were either in the White House or close to the White House and and these extremist groups. And in addition, those people ended up kind of playing off of each other and and having this almost symbiotic relationship. So Bianca Gracia is a good example. Um, she ran an organization called Latinos for Trump. Um, had a relationship with Enrique Tario years before um, uh, January 6th. And that relationship continued through the election and then through all the, the rallies. And um, they they sort of use each other for status in a way. So uh, the Proud Boys would provide security or be around these groups um, while the, the groups like Latinos for Trump would provide some legitimacy to Proud Boys or Oath Keepers who were defending them. Um, and so a lot of these, a lot of these people just love to walk around these events and have this circle of people around them protecting them. Um, and, and so there was this relationship where they played off each other um, and kind of increased their own status. And, and, and then individuals like Bianca Gracia and Roger Stone were embedded with these groups in their text messages leading up to the day and planning for. Um, and, and so there's a close connection that. that yeah, that's, yeah. Jacob Sandeep. Uh, how did you see this from your perspective, looking also a little bit further back? And I know you talked earlier about the Jericho March, uh, Jacob. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything that Sean said. And I would also add uh, the essential point that the symbiotic relationship we saw was centered around a normalization of political violence. So these chats talked a lot about um, the threat that Antifa and or Black Lives Matter were going to pose at these events in D.C. Um, in November and December. And that meant, therefore, that these organizers like Bianca Gracia, um, for example, needed to have backup, essentially. 
And the fact that President Trump was creating this permission structure for um, people like Sue Rhodes and Enrique Tarrio to step into the breach of this supposed lawlessness um, is really dangerous long term. And we saw this uh, way, as you were mentioning, way before um, the election as well, when you have um, Black Lives Matter protests where Oath Keepers and Proud Boys both felt empowered by President Trump's rhetoric, as we saw in these depositions, to basically go out and, in their view, assist law enforcement, who at that point they, they thought were, were aligned with their objectives. Um, and that obviously, as we talked about, shifted once we got to the post-election period. But they have been training for a long time. And we had testimony from a former Oath Keepers employee, Jason Van Tatenhove, who testified at one of the hearings, um, who said that it was Stuart Rhodes's longtime plan to basically have a conservative leader who called him up to be a paramilitary general, essentially. Um, and in Trump, Rhodes saw that opportunity. So in his testimony, which Sandeep can talk about um, better than anyone, um, Stuart Rhodes said that he hoped that Trump was going to call them up, uh, the Oath Keepers, to put down the quote-unquote insurrection over the summer. He characterized the Black Lives Matter protests as an insurrection and thought that Oath Keepers should be um, taking folks into custody in peaceful protests across the country. So this was already well in place. And then by the time you get to the post-election period, they spring this plan into action. Um, and you brought up the Jericho March. And I think that's a really compelling example of what everyone's been talking about. Um, we received internal texts from one of the organizers of the Jericho March, a man named Robert Weaver, who was a failed Trump administration appointee to HHS, I believe. Um, and he was still working for HHS in some capacity at the time of these events. And he um, got connected with Stuart Rhodes got Stuart Rhodes to be a speaker on the lineup um, on stage uh, and also connected Stuart Rhodes with his event planner and said, he's going to be handling security, talk to him more. Um, and that sounds really banal in the text when you read them through, but then you step back and you realize this is a, you know, extreme paramilitary leader who is waiting to basically become some sort of authoritarian shock force. Um, and then there's a former Trump appointee, failed Trump appointee, um, trying to recruit him for his event. Um, and we also have testimony from Robert Weaver's co-founder of the Jericho March, a woman named Arena Grossu, also a Trump employee, um, the Trump administration employee, uh, who said that uh, Weaver was the one who was also in charge of communications with the White House. Um, so you have someone who we have testimony and evidence to suggest was at once talking to the White House and also speaking to Stuart Rhodes. Um, and so it's disturbing in each individual instance, but when you zoom out and look at the picture of what President Trump created before January 6th, what sticks out to me is this sort of normalization of the necessity for political actors. And the one degree of separation, exactly. always with that plausible deniability. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that my colleagues have said. And, you know, I'll, I'll add, zoom, zooming out even further, um, how important it was for President Trump to be a coalescing factor um, for these groups. And Megan was talking earlier about how many of these groups have in some cases, diametrically opposed views. Um, Trump really brought together um, a somewhat diverse ideological coalition of people who engaged in conspiratorial thinking, um, sort of engaged in weaponized victimhood that is at once offens offensive and defensive. Um, you know, when, when you think an enemy is out there, um, whether it's Antifa or BLM or people who want to steal the election or Democratic elites or what, whatever it is, it makes it easier to justify the political violence that Jacob was just talking about. Um, you know, in many cases, the, the, the members of these groups didn't like each other. The Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys didn't like each other. The Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers both hated the Groypers. Um, there was sort of infighting within the, these far-right groups and among the far-right groups, um, but Trump was a unifying factor. Um, if you, so Jacob was just talking about the Jericho March event, which happened on December 12th before January 6th. If you go back a couple of weeks prior to that, um, a bunch of these groups came together in Atlanta for a series of Stop the Steal events over several days. And you had um, the Proud Boys there, you had the Oath Keepers there, you had the Groypers, you also had Ali Alexander, like Marcus was talking about. You also had Alex Jones. You had Roger Stone, who made a guest appearance over Ali Alexander's phone through a megaphone. Um, you know, and then they, you know, Ali Alexander rallied everyone to, quote unquote, storm the Capitol uh, in, uh, in Georgia. Uh, you know, this was a group of people that was a peaceful protest. 
Um, but this was a group of people who used that opportunity to network, um, to come together under the banner of Stop the Steal and President Trump. And despite the fact that they hated each other, in fact, I think there's a video of some of the Groypers like harassing Stuart Rhodes on the street in Atlanta, but they still came together for this common cause. So they weren't so principled that they had to stick with their own uh, ideologies, it sounds like. Um, so we talked about uh, Trump sort of being the uniter. James, what did you, in the depositions that you did, uncover about, you know, Trump as the uniter when it comes and his, the influence of his rhetoric on individuals who weren't associated with these particular extremist groups? I mean, that's sort of it. Trump was the reason. Um, Marcus and I interviewed a lot of people who had pled guilty to various crimes on January 6th who otherwise were not affiliated with extremist groups, but who showed up and followed the crowd and went in and did some, you know, pretty sometimes horrible things, sometimes just going in and coming out. But sometimes uh, these defendants would try to claim it wasn't President Trump that brought them there. We had some people saying they wanted to protect the country from Black Lives Matter, from Antifa. They wanted to show up and sort of do something to make the country better for their kids very vaguely. But as soon as you drill down to, well, why'd you show up on January 6th for no other date? You know, President Trump was there. They either wanted to see President Trump speak. They wanted to be there for his last rally if they admitted at all uh, that they were there for him. But others were like, yeah, I came because President Trump called us to action. Um, plenty and plenty and plenty of defendants have uh, responded to President Trump's December 19th tweet uh, saying, you know, this is the call we've been waiting for. Even if they were not otherwise associated with extremist groups, there were people who, after Trump's December 19th tweet, went out and tried to find, how do I get connected to the Proud Boys? Or, you know, texting a cousin like, hey, do you know an Oath Keeper? They were, or what's the 3%er? There were people who were looking to join groups after that tweet because they felt that they had been waiting for someone to call them to do something to save their country. And they had, you know, it was President Trump who did it. And it's no surprise, as Sandeep was saying, that there is a, you know, in a sense, diverse coalition. But all of the people who responded to the call felt the same threat to their, I don't know if it's existence or their own view of what the country should be, but there was the fear of change and the fear of something different, maybe even existential fear that democracy was going to end. And that's enough. And President Trump reinforced that view, gave light to the grievances, said, you are right. This is happening to you. Uh, there is an elite takeover. I'm, you know, I'm one of the elites. I saw it happen. I will protect you. I will be your savior. And that's, that uh, messaging made him sort of, you know, you can smooth out all the other differences. They don't matter because everyone's fighting on the same side. And I think even on January 6th, as came out in the Oath Keeper trials, or I think the Oath Keeper trials, you can see that Stuart Rhodes and Enrique Terrio are talking about, well, today we're on the same side. You know, we're all fighting for the same cause. Did you see, and I, and, and I want to toss it to Megan to come back to the social media point, but before we go there, I did you see um, also the threads of legitimate grievances that had never been addressed as a reason why people were willing to put aside sort of differences in their ideology and be vulnerable to Trump's cause, to, to, to Trump's calling them. Because, you know, there are people in the country who feel like um, the country has passed them by, whether it's economically, socially, educationally. Uh, some of this is driven by also false information, um, but a lot of it is uh, seems to be driven by this this feeling that everything's zero sum, right? If there's more equality for others or more initiatives that raise up others, that means I must I must going, be going to be losing something, right? And we certainly have seen there's areas of the country where, you know, the predominant industry for you know decades or even hundreds of years is now defunct, and the there's you know uh, lack of economic prosperity and upward mobility, and so. I guess what I'm asking is, you know, there's there there are legitimate grievances there. Is that what you're saying was being played on, or is it something more than that, or a combination? So it's definitely a combination, and nothing justifies storming the Capitol in this situation. So, but I like to think of it, and I wrote about this uh, in an op-ed for the New York Times, and 
underneath all of the sort of unbelievable views, like how can you believe this? You have to wonder why people were susceptible to believe conspiracy theories like QAnon, to believe that the election had been stolen, to believe President Trump's rhetoric about what Black Lives Matter and Antifa mean. You have to think about you know, what made people susceptible to that. And we saw in a lot of our interviews uh, ex explicit statements about how people felt that elites had left them behind. And, you know, there's some truth in the fact that American public policy over the last 50 years has not been kind to most Americans and has tilted heavily to favoring those who are already powerful. So that little kernel of truth kind of undergirds a lot of views that people had that were distrustful of American institutions that hadn't really served them necessarily, or who, when they do serve them, can't explain how they're doing it. Uh, COVID's a, you know, a more immediate example of that. There were varying responses to the virus, and immediately it was clear that people didn't trust what their governments were saying to them. Uh, you know, A lot of it's conspiracy theory, but if you come from a place where the public health system hasn't done anything for you in a long time, and if you're a small business owner who loses all of your you know, customers, or you're an employee who loses your job because someone you don't really understand why tells you to shut down. That's where a lot of this anger comes from, you know, legitimate or not, that's there. And it's, I think, a, a problem that the American public, we need to grapple with this, like, right away, uh, how to bring people back into the fold so that they actually trust what our governments are doing and that they actually believe in the system of deliberative democracy, if they don't believe in the system as it stands, they're going to be more likely to do things like storm the Capitol because they think they're saving the country. Yeah. So uh, I want to be careful in, in this kind of discourse that trying to understand the motivations doesn't veer into sympathizing with their motivations. And I mean, it's well documented that there were significant, you know, white supremacist strains motivating a lot of people, um, whether it was explicit or not, you know, a lot of the grievances, when you peel them back, there is often white supremacy at the core. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that a lot of the leaders uh, of far right movements and groups often cynically exploited um, people's legitimate or not grievances um, for their own ends. I mean, we saw Jason Van Tatenhove, who, who testified in one of our hearings, talk about how Stuart Rhodes um, kind of saw President Trump as an opportunity. He saw the Oath Keepers as an opportunity to build himself up. Um, he's also, if you look at his deposition transcript, he you know, derides people who believe in QAnon. And then at the same time, in his internal Oath Keepers chats, he, you know, deploys QAnon slogans to try to motivate people in his group. I mean, the people in charge, including then President Trump, were very cynically exploiting what people feared, um, what people believed, and pushed them further in one direction. And, and, and a lot of that was happening in many different venues, but on social media. And, and I want to before we get too, for, too much further along on some of these other motivations, I want to go back to you, Megan, because, you know, again, there were a lot of players in this, but, but Trump himself, of course, was extremely active on social media until he was banned. Um, and, you know, thinking about even things he said off social media, but that lived forever there, like uh, famously during the debate with um Joe Biden, when he told the Proud Boys to stand back and stand by, I believe that there was testimony, I think, from Jeremy Bertino that, that you know, their popularity and applications uh, just exponentially went up after that, and that lived forever on social media. But, you know, part of these false narratives and part of this appeal to grievances and using it for political gain happened online. And how did social media respond to that, and how did they treat that, particularly coming from the former president, but, but from others as well? Well, as is typically the case with content moderation policies on social media, they tend to be reactive. And that was very much the case with regards to what happened on January 6th. So 
I'll give credit where it's due, right? We have, um, you know, a bunch of the the mainstream platforms had booted the Oath Keepers, for example, long before January 6th. Facebook had nuked a ton of QAnon groups and pages in the fall of 2020. So there was, to some extent, a handling of outwardly extremist content that was violative among platforms that actually have content moderation policies. Of course, there are plenty that do not. Um, and they obviously attract a fundamentally different audience or user base than, than the mainstream platforms. But what made this situation so unique is that we had a sitting president who had a long established call and response dynamic with his supporters, exactly to your point with the stand back and stand by comment, which became a rallying cry that way outlived kind of that that moment of relevance that it had back in September of 2020. Um, and so not only do we have like, right, we had this call and response dynamic that Trump knew he had with his supporters. We had, you know, he had the stamp of approval from a mainstream political party. And he had the legitimacy that fundamentally comes with being the president of the United States. And he was fueling anti-democratic narratives and conspiracy theories um, that were completely baseless. And he was able to do so because he was allowed to operate unrestricted on mainstream social media platforms where he had the eyes and ears of hundreds of millions of people, whether they followed him or not. Because even if you weren't following Trump, there were people who were retweeting him or engaging negatively, you know, quote, retweeting him and commenting. And then you had cable news um, commenting on the tweets as well and, and the posts as well and further amplifying them. And ultimately, Trump received special treatment from these platforms. And, you know, the the select committee did find that as a, as a result of the social, uh, the social media investigation. And many people who were spreading the same narratives that Trump was, they were either suspended or reported or banned, or they had, you know, earlier on, they, they were flagged for, for various, you know, for acting in a violative way. Um, but Trump wasn't, not for a really long time. It was too little too late. And, you know, it wasn't just Trump, of course, there were sitting members of Congress or cable news talking heads or big name influencers who were peddling these same conspiracy theories and incendiary rhetoric to their followers as well. And ultimately, this culminated in the ability of Trump to spread dangerous talking points and straight up lies that had been previously relegated to the fringes of political discourse. And he did so with abandon. And as a byproduct of that, he legitimized the views of extremists. So we had groups like the Oath Keepers whose entire existence was built upon standing against, you know, oppressive governments beginning to see themselves as part of this legitimate political system because the sitting president was saying the same things they were and had been saying for years. And he was allowed to do so by social media platforms. And then on top of that, we have everyday Americans seeing these narratives as well and thinking, oh, well, they must be true if they're being shared by the president on a mainstream platform. Um, and I, simply put, Trump would not have been able to mobilize thousands of people, thousands of his supporters to the Capitol on January 6th to prevent the peaceful transition of power without social media. It just I really don't think it would have happened. Well, and that that leads me, you know, this week, uh, many of us in this room, this is a room full of law students and lawyers and people who follow the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court heard argument in a case about Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. It's a it's a piece of law that dates back to the infancy of the internet in the 1990s that essentially protects social media and all other internet computer service or platforms from liability for the harms that they cause. And one of the issue, or the issue that was um, in the Supreme Court this week was whether the algorithmic targeted rec recommendations that are uh, a feature of so much social media, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and the like, that continue to give viewers more and more and more of what they appear to like based on studying what those viewers look at or what they read or what they consume. Those targeted algorithms done for uh, profit purposes so that uh, more viewers by sucking people into rabbit holes means more advertisement, means more money. Um, and the question before the Supreme Court, for those of you who haven't been following it, is is, is the immunity that Section 230 provides for, for Internet platforms who are merely publishing third party content, does that apply to their algorithms when they've created those algorithms that draw people into that rabbit hole? And Megan, I guess I'm interested in your view about that rabbit hole and whether that feature 
of social media um, you think played a role in what we saw here really of the radicalization of people over the course of time to the point where they were willing to storm the Capitol? That is a great question. Um, ultimately, this is a question that social media researchers and academics have long tried to answer, and it's hard to do because naturally there's, you know, algorithms are proprietary. Um, you can obviously gauge some answers through experiments and, um, you know, online ethnographic research, et cetera. Um, but the algorithm question is a sticky one. And I think and I know this is uh, this is a very hot topic and I and a contentious one. And I'm I'm not I think there are plenty of social you know people who who work on social media and engage with the affordances of social media, which is not only inclusive out of algorithms, but also the ways in which users can interact with one another on platforms and the way that they can interact with information on platforms, right? Like YouTube is basically a library of information. It's a search engine as much as it is a social media platform, whereas obviously like you're not conducting searches about information on Facebook. At least I hope you're not. And <laughs> so each, each platform is obviously fundamentally different and therefore each algorithm is fundamentally different. So it's hard to kind of paint this argument with a broad brush, but I think something that we should be talking about, and I've made this case a few times, you know, since serving on the committee. Um, and again, this is the part where I'm not sure if people would agree with me, which is that I think there's a hyper focus on algorithms. And this is not to say that they don't play a role in pushing people in a certain direction online or feeding them certain content. They absolutely do. But I, I think if platforms were better at moderating content, and this doesn't even necessarily mean stricter mo content moderation policies, this just means like actually upholding the ones that they already have. If they were better about that and had the money um, or invested the money in that, I and time and expertise, I think the, the controversy surrounding the algorithm would be lessened because it, if there's no or less problematic content on a given platform, then the chances of an algorithm serving that content to a user is fundamentally lower. So I think content moderation is obviously harder. It's more nuanced. It's, it's, not as easy of a boogeyman as the algorithms. But I think that's probably where we should start is figuring out, you know, because if Silicon Valley could get rid of all of the algorithms tomorrow, and there would still be problematic content on virtually, every, no, literally every platform. So I think we need a little bit more nuance in the debate. And I think algorithms do not stand alone as the problem, not by a landslide. Yeah, and that that point reminds me that there's also just a lot of plat there's other platforms that were uh, very very instrumental in I think um, radicalizing people uh, to commit the acts of violence they did, which were not the mainstream ones, not the Facebooks and the Twitters and the YouTubes, but the Donald Dot Win and um, Gab and you know some of the others like that. Um, but to go back to the rabbit hole problem, because I, I take your point, I think it's a really valid one. Marcus, I think you might have been the one who interviewed Stephen Ayers, who's the man who actually ended up testifying uh, at one of the live hearings. Um, I think the same hearing that Jason Van Tatenhove testified at. And he seemed to present as someone who went down a rabbit hole. Is that was that your reaction um, or yeah. what did you learn from him? That was that was my reaction. Um, that was a was kind of a classic story that we heard from defendants in particular was this rabbit hole of whether it be COVID lockdown or isolation of some sort, um, reading conspiracy theories on social media or in the Internet in general, um, just having more time on their hands and having grievances, whether it be economic grievances, racial animus, homophobic animus, things of that nature, leading them to kind of confirm their worldview through these social media posts. Um, Stephen Ayers was different in that um, look. I think he was having a reckoning. And this is my personal impression of Stephen Ayers. I it felt like he was having a personal reckoning of what he might have believed in the past and what he should believe moving forward. You could tell he was still trying to come to grips of what is reality and what is not. And I think that played out on national TV with some of the questioning. It, it, I mean, you saw some of the inconsistencies in what he said. Um, and that came out in the interviews with, with Mr. Ayers. And so, um, Look, I think the social media dynamic of what we read and what we see constantly being peddled, whether it be, I'm not going to say any specific media companies, but I, I think it's 
I think it's a real issue that we have to kind of figure out um, because Stephen Ayers was a pretty classic example of, and look, I've heard other people on the committee and, and other people that saw the hearing say, look, I went to school with Stephen Ayers. I think we can all relate to who Stephen Ayers was. And we have to make sure that we come up with policies that prevent, you know, the Stephen Ayers that we went to high school with from going down the path that he went down to led him to the Capitol on January 6th. Do others of you want to comment on, on the social media role? Yeah, I was just going to say that there, I mean, the other thing to think about here is, is there's sort of this, this progression of this, this stepwise radicalization that happens, which first it occurs on social media, but talking about other platforms, you know, January 6th, it would have been very difficult to carry out January 6th without platforms like Telegram or Signal, um, which is where we saw a lot of, you know, obviously the planning and communication happens there, but also the really extreme versions of radicalization happen there because those are these kind of online private safe spaces mm -hmm. where people all of a sudden feel like they can say even more and go even farther. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we saw that time and time again and messages between the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys um, and, and that that's where people really start to, to kind of move from this sort of public space radicalization to individual planning of events. And you saw that with the Ministry of Self-Defense, right? Right. And so, yeah, so for anybody that hasn't heard about the, or hasn't read about it, the Ministry of Self-Defense was a chapter within the Proud Boys. Um, it's organized regionally mostly, but then there was also the Ministry of Self-Defense, which was founded kind of after this event, Jeremy Pertino getting stabbed in uh, in the December 12th rally. And that was around planning for future events like that and for planning for their self-defense. And it became this just online chapter of the Proud Boys where the most extreme members of those Proud Boys coalesced and, and advanced their planning. Um, and, and so those are important platforms to pay attention to here as well. And I think going to, to Megan's point about social media in general, um, a lot of the depositions we conducted with uh, whistleblowers within Twitter, um, folks like Jody Williams, who is the owner of the Donald.win, a really extreme Trump forum, um, shows a broader problem that our social media companies, like other American institutions, don't know how to deal with a prolonged, sustained anti-democratic coalition um, existing within American politics and willing to uh, flirt with or engage in political violence. Um, and so I think at a baseline, a company like Twitter, based on the deposition evidence we obtained, um, just simply didn't know what to do with the fact there was an autocrat in, in the White House and what to do with how they normally treated an American president versus what this American president was doing. And um, I think that there are situations in countries elsewhere in the world where it seems like Twitter would have a really good idea of what to do to, to stop potential civil war. Um, and they just didn't want to... to admit that there was the potential for political violence in this country, let alone political violence fueled by the president. And, and I will say as a, as a brief note, um, in our deposition of Jody Williams, who was an owner of the Donald uh, Wynn, uh, he also brought up the fact that his forum on Reddit, which was a, a long running r slash the Donald forum, um, was allowed to stay on Reddit and advertise uh, the Donald uh, Wynn freely for months um, after the Reddit had been suspended for basically threatening public officials, I think, in the Pacific Northwest. And that, to us, was another example, or my personal impression, another example of these social media companies not really knowing how to grapple with um, the fact that there is a real possibility for anti-democratic mobilization in this country. Um, and so that's something that, moving forward, uh, we still need to deal with as a society. We are going to do a round of moving forward before we end, and uh, I, and then we are going to have time for questions, so be thinking of them. But before we do that, uh, I want to ask James, and then you, Sandeep, this question about social media, too. I think in particular, James, you maybe looked into more of the QAnon conspiracy theory aspect. Uh, QAnon a little, I mean, there, there wasn't that much more to QAnon. A lot of people, not a lot, uh, the def a lot of the defendants we interviewed would flirt with QAnon, I'd say, you know, they would be aware of the QAnon conspiracy theories and espouse some of them, and then deny that they followed QAnon, even though they were reading about it. So, um, or wearing a Q or hat. we <laughs> yeah. actually found out later that was a rum, a type of rum, but <laughs> inside story, um, had some interesting interviews, uh, back to social media though. I think there's another, if we're talking about private spaces, uh, I listen to a lot of Zello chats that 
were recorded. Mm -hmm. And that was a place that turned into a very violent, uh, often explicitly racist place heading up into January 6th. Um, and I think, honestly, like, people just think that that's a place where they can talk. So, you know, reading a lot of 3% or chat groups, uh, they found sympathetic voices where, you know, before social media, you're just kind of shouting into the wind. And then if you find someone who agrees with what you're saying and you, you kind of doubled down, you know, like Megan said, not majority of the people who were posting probably didn't show up, but for every thousand who didn't, there was one who did, who was like, Oh, everyone else is going to bring a gun and go shoot anyone who's in black lives matter. Cause that makes a lot of sense, but that person would show up. So I think it's a, you know, it obviously had an effect on people and it was kind of dangerous to say the least. So I, you know, I subscribe to everything that my colleague said and you know, to connect the digital space to the physical space, you know, one thing that was clear and Jacob was talking about the sustained anti-democratic movement that views political violence as legitimate, you know, you have to go back very far to understand the roots of that. But, you know, quite recently, prior to January 6th, looking at the conspiracies surrounding COVID-19 and the initial lockdowns um, that were happening in states, a lot of the groups that formed on social media during that time eventually became the scaffolding for groups that became Stop the Steal groups that uh, also included many of the same people who came to D.C. on January 6th. And, you know, if you, you know, look at that and then also look at the fact that a lot of the state capital incursions that happened over the course of 2020, you know, really starting with the April 2020 Michigan incident that involved several people who uh, several people who were involved in the kidnapping plot against Governor Whitmer, but also several people who came to D.C. on January 6th. Um, and then you had Boise, Idaho in August 2020. You had the Atlanta event that I was talking about before, um, and you also had, you know, just a week or two prior to January 6th in Oregon, um, there was an incident where if you watch videos of it, uh, it didn't get much media attention at the time. I'm not sure why. If you look at videos of it, you can't tell whether it's from D.C. on January 6th or whether it was actually from Oregon. I mean, you had people trying to break into the state capitol building fighting, engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Oregon state police officers, spraying them with bear spray to try to interrupt a legislative session regarding COVID-19 mm -hmm. legislation. Um, so that, you know, January 6th was, uh, you know, it was a unique event. It was also, it didn't exist in a vacuum. It was, um, you know, you could see it kind of ha happening in slow motion. Uh, in the months prior to it, and um, not just on social media, but in the, in the physical world, too. And, you know, that reminds me of, you know, one of our major events of stepping out of that virtual space and into the physical space, which was the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville in 2017, August 2017, when we had really, for the, for the first time in modern history, that many different groups. Again, I, you know, with a core grievance that brought them together, but ideologically with differences, neo-Nazis, neo-Confederates, um, accelerationists, um, uh, and others who all put aside whatever their differences might otherwise be to step out of that virtual space and into that physical space. So this is something that's been kind of growing for years. So the question is now, we are two years post um, January 6th um, in, in our, my own work uh, with some of you, um, and with Megan, um, is it has seen a change in strategy to be a more decentralized, localized strategy of sort of getting involved at that very local level, taking over school boards, county boards, uh, you know, opposing and seeking recall election of moderate Republicans in order for, in, in order to uh, put forth more extreme ones, and and also supporting election deniers, um, and I could go on and on. And so what I think we had all some kind of somehow hoped would be over um, after January 6th was very much not over. So I guess, but of course I hate to 
you know, end on a downer note. So do you see hope? Uh, what do you see? And I'll go back to you, Marcus, to kick us off and um, and just let everybody have sort of a lightning round on, on your what worries you or what gives you hope uh, going forward. Well, everyone will probably on the panel will laugh at this. I'm always going to try to find hope in, in anything. Uh, one thing I want to highlight, though, I guess that we didn't really touch on. This will be kind of like my ending. I think the part that was the hardest for me personally was the veteran side of the people we talked to. Um, for those of you who don't know, I started my career in the Air Force. I was a prosecutor. And one of my first investigations in the Air Force was investigating one percent of motorcycle clubs that were actively recruiting um, active duty Air Force members in the South and kind of those entanglements. And fast forwarding to the January 6th investigation, there were just so many parallels that I'm sure Sandeep and Sasso and Quinn and Glick and Megan are just tired of hearing about when we would finish an interview. Uh, it just felt like the same type of dynamic when I would talk to the Air Force guys that I started about, why are you in these one percent or motorcycle gangs? As when we were talking to these veterans that were in the Oath Keepers, and it's something that I'm passionate about is providing the right support for our military after and during our service. And uh, I think January 6th was just a reminder. The investigation was a reminder of how much work we still have to do. A lot of these individuals felt that they had served their country, had sacrificed, their, which they had sacrificed for their country in certain ways. They felt alone. Um, and this is how they felt that camaraderie again. And I think they were a group that was easily manipulated, just like a lot of military folks were all, when I was in the service were easily manipulated. And it just took a strong leader who made them feel needed and allowed them to uh, kind of do the things they did on January 6th. So this is more of a policy uh, perspective I'm providing right now. Everyone who knows me knows I'm not a policy guy. I'm a prosecutor investigator. So I, I can uncover the facts, but I think these are questions we need to be answering moving forward is how do we provide the necessary support? Um, how do we root out the extremism in our military, active duty and veterans? Um, and I think that's something we need to continue to think about as we move forward. I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, this is not a new phenomenon. Uh, Kathleen Ballou wrote a book called Bring the War Home about the post-Vietnam era where our veterans felt like they had not been supported both at during the war and afterwards. And, and, and you know, that led to uh, the real rise and development of Aryan Nation and other um, group, militia groups and extremist groups. And we're seeing in some ways a repeat of that. And we're seeing people who want to have a mission, who are mission oriented. I can relate as well, 20 over 20 years as a prosecutor myself, most of my career in the federal government always felt very mission oriented. And suddenly when they don't have a mission, they're going to find one. But there's a lot of great missions for our veterans. So I think our veterans affairs department needs to get on that and provide those good and worthy uh, missions to our veterans. Um, Jacob. Sure. So I guess I can start a little bit more down than, than Marcus and then end in a good place, hopefully. Um, I think one thing that I worry about a lot when I think about our investigation and what we found um, is how January 6th was a coming out party for this coalition of individuals. We talk a lot about alliances of convenience and how these groups like to distinguish between themselves. And I think um, we talk about the differences between them a lot. But the reality is that we saw it in Charlottesville. We saw it during COVID, BLM, January 6th. These groups can come together, and I think January 6th showed them that they can be legitimate actors in a political environment that includes Donald Trump and people like Donald Trump, and they are emboldened to actually take on law enforcement and take on perceived ideological opponents. And what I'm really worried about is what happens next. Um, where do they set their sights next? And we've seen this, and we've written about this, um, that there has been a, a slew of targets that have come under fire, um, both literal and figurative, since January 6th. First, we saw um, groups like the Proud Boys really targeting um, mask mandates and critical race theory in public schools and taking really aggressive action against um, school boards and local government. And in the last year, we've seen a lot of targeting of the queer community um, at drag events and elsewhere. Uh, and I, I am a gay Jewish American, and there are a lot of, there's a lot of diversity um, on both the red and the purple team. Um, and I think that was the hardest part um, of the job for me was sitting in these depositions, trying to get the facts, but also seeing um, in some level that these were people who didn't believe that I or many of my colleagues belonged in the country in a certain way. This was not our society. And they saw January 6th as a victory. So the question now is, what do we do um, to understand that this threat hasn't gone away 
and that the um, sort of trickle uh, towards mass catastrophe that we saw leading up to January 6th arguably is happening again as we see these one-off events um, at drag events, for example. We've talked within the last almost 90 minutes talking about the one-off events that led up to January 6th, and I think we need to uh, start learning the same lessons as we look at what's happening with the Proud Boys uh, now and act before it's too late. So that's my hopeful end note that even though we saw January 6th as perhaps the pivotal point where a sustained anti-democratic movement um, entered our political scene, um, now we all know that they're here too. Uh, and so we can take the steps we need to do as a civil society, as a government, as a um, civilization to, to try to counter that. Um, and I, ho I hope that's what we do. Sean? Yeah, I just, I kind of wanted to piggyback on something that Marcus had said, which is a theme we saw kind of come up in lots of the interviews that we did, which is that a lot of these folks were, were manipulated by people with resources and, and power. And whether or not that was Stuart Rhodes or Enrico Terrio manipulating and grifting off the members of their organization, or whether it was President Trump, or whether it was, um, you know, folks on Fox News who were spreading lies uh, and supporting President Trump's lies. Um, we constantly saw that these folks were motivated by people that they trusted uh, and, and believed that they were acting for a righteous cause because of what they had been told. Um, and so I think my primary takeaway is that, yeah, we have these people in these, in these vulnerable positions, veterans or people who feel displaced, um, and it's easy to kind of swap out a purpose that they're missing for this, uh, this, this message that Trump spread. And so just it's, it's just always attempting to kind of hold that power to account um, and making sure that, that folks that have that sort of voice are, um, yeah, are held accountable. Smart, smart. James. I am by nature a cynical person. Uh, so I'm going, but I'm trying to put a little bit of my hopeful hat on. The, what made uh, me a little more hopeful is that we actually ended up interviewing a lot of people who stormed the Capitol or were involved in some way who ran for office, and they all lost. <laughs> and, so that's great. Uh, also, the midterm elections, yes. there are a lot of reasons uh, Republicans didn't do as well. I think one reason is that there is at least a thin enough wall of people in this country who believe that democracy trumps policy or democracy trumps anything else, that they were willing to not vote for uh, autocratic insurrectionist type candidates in state elections, too. I'm not just talking about Congress, but if you look at uh, Secretary of State races in Michigan and Arizona and Pennsylvania, these really important uh, races for future elections. And that gave me some hope because I was very worried that the people who control elections at the local level would end up manipulating future elections. Um, I also think as, you know, to piggyback off Sean and Marcus, there are ways that we can bring people back into the fold who felt, who felt lost by having policies that support them. You know, if policies, like I was mentioning earlier, helps lead to this distrust in the government, you would think policies would also be able to help. But then the cynic in me goes back to Sandeep's really good point. There are other reasons why people were willing to listen to President Trump, such as racism, that are a lot harder to uh, just get rid of, as we've seen over 400 years of American history. And also, this isn't a new thing in America to have autocratic tendencies. Um, Rachel Maddow did a great podcast about yep. World War II and Nazism. So it's not so easy. And when so many people in the country are armed to the teeth and so many, and the division seems so raw still, I am worried, to be honest, about where we go from here. And I think that we cannot pretend that we survived January 6th, that the midterms went pretty well, that things seem stable. We shouldn't fall into complacency. And we have to be really vigilant, you know, about who we trust with power and institutions that people listen to and what we do from here. Thanks, James. So, um, you know, I, when Jacob gave his remarks just now, I agreed with, um, I agreed with them. You know, it was pretty hard to work on this material and engage with 
social media content and depositions and and you interview witnesses who you know held beliefs that included the dehumanization of people like me or people who share the identities that I have. Um, and I mean, that was really challenging, but also felt very necessary. And so, you know, I, like James, tend towards cynicism um, and catastrophizing, um, but I will keep my optimism kind of narrow uh, in that I'm really proud of what the select committee was able to do. Uh, you know, by giving Americans and people involved in political discourse a sort of language to talk about election denialism helped ensure that election deniers didn't win in November. Um, you know, by ensuring that there is a complete factual record of what happened in the lead up to and on January 6th, you're ensuring that, you know, regardless of whether some, whether Someone is out there right now slicing and dicing surveillance footage to achieve whatever partisan or conspiratorial ends there may be. There is a factual record of what happened out there. Um, and I think that's really important. Congressional investigations are unique in that, you know, they're not DOJ prosecutions. They're not focused on individuals who committed individual acts or a set of related acts. You're, te you're telling the whole story. There's a lot of stuff that the committee covered that isn't criminal conduct, but was still really important to telling the story of how January 6th happened and what happened. So I think that work was really important and I'm optimistic because of that. Well, we are all thankful because of that as well. Megan, give us the last word and gosh, have I, oh my gosh, I've almost uh, gone through all of our question time, but I'll see if, I'll see if we have a few more minutes at the end. Um, well, thanks, Mary. And Mary, of course, as you know, I spend basically all day, every day online um, watching these narratives and the way they unfold. And unfortunately, that means I'm probably going to be the most cynical of all <laughs> of my fellow panelists. Should have had you go first. <laughs> yeah, I'm really sorry. Um, yeah. So I think ultimately the way things stand, at least as I and my colleagues have, have observed them, is we're seeing this shift away from organizations and official chapters of organizations. And I think that really kind of captures the realistic picture of far right extremism in the US as, as it exists today. And actually this kind of applies transnationally as well. This, the domestic extremist landscape no longer relies heavily on these groups the way it did and rather structures itself as like this amorphous ever changing spider web that includes kind of every level of extremist entity, whether that's in individuals, right? Those people who made up that unaffiliated mob I talked about earlier, whether it's groups or kind of loose movements like QAnon or, you know, like James talked about the three percenters, it's a little bit more decentralized than a formal group. And also these just like mass online swarms of people who mobilize around the uproar du jour, so to speak. And so even though we have the anti-government milieu and that's the Oath Keepers, the three percenters, the Boogaloo movement, they've kind of shifted out of the public eye. And in the specific case of the Oath Keepers, obviously they've lost that kind of somewhat centralized structure with front facing leadership because, you know, they were charged and found guilty of seditious conspiracy. So even though they've kind of faded from the public eye, we should not confuse this with the decline in broader anti-government sentiment that continues to permeate literally every news story. Um, okay, literally might be hyperbole, but my point is that the Chinese spy balloons, anti-government conspiracy theories everywhere, the Ohio train derailment, an absolute hotbed for anti-government and anti-conspiracy rhetoric, or sorry, anti-media rhetoric. And that brand of sentiment that undermines key democratic institutions with bad faith arguments and conspiracy theories, it's more widespread and mainstream than ever. And I think something I know we talked a lot about social media, but I think it's really important to note that we see serving politicians peddling these narratives. We see mainstream cable news channels contributing to this. And for a lot of Americans, cable news still reigns supreme for, for where they go to seek out their, their news and, and their opinions on, on things that are unfolding in real time. So I think in future discussions about the role of social media or about the media ecosystem um, in fomenting extremism and conspiracy theories, I think those future discussions should take care to include the full breadth of the information ecosystem. So inclusive of le legacy and social media. And so I think looking ahead, 
we need to be careful not to focus on named groups the way that we once did, because we risk overlooking the true threat as it stands today, which is this network of people highly interconnected because of the internet with extreme worldviews and an increasingly normalized perception of political violence as an option. And like I mentioned earlier, I used the terms kind of collaborating, uh, co-radicalizing, co-mobilizing, and we're, we continue to see this both on and offline. And this shift from boundary groups and boundary ideological frameworks, we're seeing this shift to, to kind of people with Again, when, when I say diverse views, I want to be so clear, it's under the umbrella of the far right, right? Like this is, they all, they may have different grievances, but it's all th under this reactionary umbrella. And they're coalescing around a uniting concept. And, you know, some some scholars in the field, um, in an amazing lawfare piece, I'll point you all to uh, the mobilizing concepts piece, piece by Brian Hughes and Cynthia Miller Idris, which I tend to use as a framework. And I think on January 6th, this was the peak example, right? We saw these people coalesce around Donald Trump. And and keeping him in power. And it's just a matter of time before people unite around a new cause that they're willing to die or kill for. And frankly, I think we are just one Ruby Ridge or Waco or Dunklemp or some other kind of martyrdom or key resonant event away from things boiling over or reaching a boiling point. So on a cheerful note, um, I will say people are actually taking this threat seriously. Um, in the lead up to January 6th, I know obviously a lot of like law enforcement and intelligence um, and just kind of the broader public was brushing this off as like, oh, people are just shit posting online. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. Sorry. Um, but you know, <laughs> people are shit posting online and like, or, you know, they're just, they're just upset. They don't mean it. And in a lot of cases, when people are posting online, that may be true. Um, but when I first entered this field, like extremism studies and counterterrorism, uh, there was no funding for this. People were not paying attention to the far right, even after Charlottesville. The, the attention wasn't there. The funding wasn't there. And I think um, people are paying attention. That's why we can have events like this, that people are tuning in and listening. People care. And I think we're also shifting the narratives away from letting extremists define themselves. Like I said earlier, the Proud Boys are not just Western chauvinists. They're not just a drinking club. We know what they are now. And I think we need to take that framework and apply it to every other extremist group or movement that continues to pop up in the future. Well, I think that is actually a really great way to end um, because it is a little bit hopeful there. And I do apologize for um, uh, not leaving any time for questions, but I think that just shows how rich the dialogue was, how much we were able to learn from all six of you. And it really just gives me ideas for so many more things I'd like to talk about with you and others. Um, and I want to uh, give a round of applause to our panelists and thank everybody also for coming today. And I, I should just say, not just for our panelists, but for the work that they spent a year and a half, probably 24-7 in windowless cubicles doing for the American people. So, yeah.